Hey, before we get to the podcast, we want to share with you an exciting new way you can help support the podcast. Yes, we have finally opened a Patreon account. Go to patreon.com slash 2NJB to check it out. We have four different tiers, and they each allow you to support the podcast at a different level, and you get really cool rewards. So go to patreon.com slash 2NJB and help us continue putting out great content for you. Thank you, guys. For 74 years, Israel has been a beacon of progress, economic success, and democracy in the harsh and ruthless land that is called the Middle East. As former Prime Minister Ehud Barak once said, a villa in the jungle. But as you plunge headfirst into the history of Israel and the Jewish people, you come to the realization that our thriving economy and democracy isn't obvious at all. In fact, in 1948, when the state of Israel was established, there were only 24 democracies on the face of the globe, a mere one-fourth of existing states back then. And so you can't help but wonder, how were the foundations to this anomaly that is our existence here laid down? And if we played so many cards right, how come we can't quite reach the high standards of living that you see in the most successful countries on earth, like the Scandinavian countries, Canada, Australia, or even America. To answer these mind-boggling questions and many more, with us today is Dr. Ori Katz, the author of the new book, Blue and White Money, published in Hebrew. He is also the co-host of the Hebrew podcast, Creative Destruction, which is about economics. Dr. Katz has a doctorate in economics, specializing in economic growth and the history of economy. And we are super, super thrilled to have Dr. Ori Katz on the show with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So where should we start? Why why aren't we, if everything is so good, why, why aren't we feeling like we live in Switzerland or Sweden? Because we have a different history. I mean, my approach in my book is that most of the things that we see today, most of the results that we see today in many countries are a a feature of the history, of the different histories of these people, of these countries. And this is both the reason for why Israel was established as a developed country from the beginning, and also the reason why Israel can't uh, uh, really reach the high living standards that we see in some other countries. As a product of history in the sense that decision, certain decisions were made historically that led to this point or a product of history in the sense of like our context, our geographical context or our neighbors? Like what about what in history made Israel what it is today? So um, in the literature of uh, economic growth, the trend in the recent in the recent years was to, to see that uh, the histories of different countries really relate to the historical features of institutions and cultural traits. And when you think about Israel and about Jews, uh, I'm, we're talking about hundreds of years uh, when we l- we were living in the diaspora. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the diaspora. Diaspora. Yeah, diaspora. Yeah. 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 diaspora. And the Gola. Uh, yeah, and uh, in those years, there was like uh, the different uh, cultural traits and uh, institutional traits of the Jewish people were um, established. I mean, and uh, these uh, traits affected the history of Israel. I mean, uh, when I talk in my book and talk about. Um, two uh, main things. One is the human capital levels, the very high levels of human capital, which was something that uh, Israel had uh, even before the state of Israel became. Uh, And uh, you can see it in various uh, statistics. You can see that, uh, for example, in terms of education level, uh, in 1948, Israel was probably the most educated country in the world. 
or at least one of the most educated countries uh, in terms of um, the share of people that had like uh, degrees from universities uh, and other things like that. Uh, and you can also see this in the institutions that made Israel a democracy to begin with. I mean, when you think about Israel and you think about where the people, uh, the, the origin countries from which the people immigrated to Israel, most of those countries uh, were not democracies in 1948. Many of them are not democracies even today. We're talking about countries like uh, Ukraine and uh, Ukraine and uh, Poland and uh, countries Russia. Like Russia, yeah, Eastern Europe. I mean, they, most of these countries feign to be democracies, at least now. Yeah, they. Some of them uh, became democracies after the collapse of the Soviet Union, mm. but uh, most of them were far from being being uh, democratic then countries. And and, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. And also m many people came here uh, from the Middle East, yeah. which is not uh, very democratic. And still they established a democratic country in Israel, which is quite surprising. And uh, the reason for that is, again, the history of the Jewish people and the way that uh, Jewish communities uh, were... Uh, the, the way that they lived in the diaspora and uh, the way that they organized uh, the leadership and uh, different choices that they made and so on. It's not, you don't mainly attribute it to the fact that the, that the, that Israel was mandated by Brit, the Brits and they, they the, I mean, England was a democracy, so. Yeah, there were, there were many countries in the world that were made, that, that were uh, conquered by the Brits. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you can see countries in Africa and others, other places, and they are not democracies today. Uh, some of them became democracies later, but uh, not so fast. I mean, India, I think it took uh, several years later than it became, really became a democracy. So you attribute it more to the fact that the Jews who came here from Europe and from other places organized themselves in a democratic way wherever they were in their communities, not necessarily on a national level, but in a yeah, communal yeah. level. Yeah, when you look at the communities of uh, Jewish people in the diaspora, so most of them were quite democratic even several hundred years ago. They had uh, electors and all the men that had some level of properties uh, were able to elect uh, leaders and so on. And this is in times when in most countries you have uh, kings and emperors and uh, you, don't, you don't really see uh, democratic countries. And uh, the Jewish uh, already then were uh, able to establish democratic institutions or, or maybe proto-democratic institu institutions. Uh, and they were just uh, used to live like that. They were used to uh, make decisions by a majority vote. They were used that uh, the leaders try to convince one another, not with uh, armed knights and uh, with fighting and so on, but uh, in peaceful ways. Mm. I mean, this is something cultural that we had mm -hmm. before we established the state of Israel. Also in the book, you say something mind boggling, which is that like 75% of banks Right, uh, were owned by Jews in 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 Eastern Europe or in Europe, yeah, or something I don't, like that. I don't remember exactly. I think this is uh, in the Warsaw, but um, in Poland. Yeah, in Poland. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I mean, Jews uh, were very successful after the Industrial Revolution, where uh, when uh, human capital became a very important trait in the economic life and. Uh, I mean, we just had we just had a head start in this area of uh, human capital. Uh, I mean, in my book, I, I go back to the um, yeah the rebel the rebellion against the, the Romans. Yeah, the rebellion against the Romans, where things started to, uh, to change, and we had like this uh, norm of teaching all young children to read and write, which was which was something that uh, you you could not see in other. Uh, uh, countries in other cultures, religions. Cultures, yeah. But 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 still in forty eight, okay. Th there's this contradiction, right? Because yeah, okay, they chose democracy, but they didn't take. But they did take from the from the failed countries the socialist socialistic ideology, communism. Yeah. So it's not really communism. They were not communist, but uh, this is uh, this is the downside. 
of the history of the people that immigrated to Israel. Uh, that uh, when you look at uh, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, people that had like a more uh, capitalistic ideals and the more individualistic ideas tended to immigrate to the United States, not to Israel. Uh, if you want to come to Israel, you need to, re to be really, you need to have an, a strong ideology and you need to have a strong commitment to building a new world and you have you need to have some, maybe some illusions about how you can shape society and create a society from scratch. Mm -hmm. So uh, people that uh, are, this, this type of people tend to be more socialist and they tend to think of, uh, of the economic sphere as something that you can just uh, make, like you, you, you're making a statue out of uh, plastilin. I'm not, I'm not sure how you say Out of clay. Yeah, out of clay. Yeah, uh, and so those, these are the type of people that immigrated to Israel, uh, at least in the beginning. Only after uh, 1924, where the United States uh, closed its gates to many immigrants from Eastern Europe, only then you see people that are more uh, like business owners and capitalists and uh, people that have factories and so on. You see those people start to come into Israel. So you 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 uh, earlier you mentioned that the two main factors, the two main variables are the fact that if I heard you right, are the are human capital and the fact that Israel chose democracy. Yeah, I mean and it's not just the, the democracy for itself; it's what uh, the democracy reflects. Democracy uh, democracy reflects trust, and trust is very very important for economic activity, uh, and it also reflects uh, meritocracy meritocratic institution. Mer yeah, meritocracy. Meritocracy, yeah. Uh, and I mean, for example, when you think about um, the war that we have against the Arabs, and you see that the, uh, the armies in both sides, so m in most Arab nations, the army was commanded by people that had some relationship to the royal family or some, I mean, they were members of some specific tribe and stuff like that. In Israel, it was usually the most talented people that commanded armies and commanded uh, uh, all the all the wars. So also the leadership. Yeah, the leadership. The most talented people. Uh, yeah. More or less. I More mean, they did climb yeah. the talented people. Ta maybe they were also talented in politics. Yeah. But they were also, and I think we can't argue, they were extremely smart. And they were not corrupt. They were not corrupt. Uh, I don't know. But uh, were, uh, weren't uh, they? Not as you as you see in, uh, like in developing yeah, countries. Yeah, they didn't take for themselves. They took... They stole for for the greater good. Yeah, maybe. something like that. I mean, <laughs> w w when you see in in crisis and when you see these people, I mean, th they look more like leaders in other uh, developing uh, in other developed countries and mm -hmm. not like leaders in developing countries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't take to their own bank accounts. Yeah. that not that kind of. Uh, it seems that I guess like democracy is the free market of ideas and the, like democracy is two ideas as as i guess uh, uh free market is to economics and to capital but it's it seems to me also like the or mentioned that that we succeeded because of human capital and because of democracy in spite of like what what noel mentioned in spite of the socialism that how did we like do you feel that Today, we've shaken off most of our socialist roots. Do you think we still are burdened by them? No, we, we still have a burden. I mean, most of the burden, the most uh, frustrat frustrating thing is that uh, we don't, uh, we cannot change history. I mean, when you think about countries like Switzerland or Sweden, or uh, when you see large companies like Nokia and uh, Ikea and companies like that, most of them were founded during the 60s and the 70s. And this is a time when Israel was very socialist and most of the capital and the savings were run by the Histadrut, the labor organization, and they were run very uh, inefficiently. Most of the savings of the people in Israel went to uh, like... Uh, uh, bureaucratic wars between one clerk and another one and and many uh, white elephants i'm not sure if this uh, pilim levanim uh, but what do you mean like projects yeah, unnecessary many, projects yeah many unnecessary projects many failed companies mm -hmm. i mean we, we think about the uh, 
the, his, the Histadrut mm-hmm. run its own companies. Mm-hmm. And even inside the, the companies that were run by the Histadrut, the most successful films had to subsidize the failed companies. films mm-hmm. so you can think what what incentive this gives to an economy can you give an example for a firm in the sev- 60s 70s that was run by the the histed route uh, uh, many ones uh, i mean the loudest is the uh, concern cool which was later uh, the what cool uh the co- the nuclear no uh cool was the name of the cool uh, what yeah. was it Uh, cool industries it, it includes many industries that we still live today like Mahdeshi uh, Magan uh, it was part of the cool it's like industries. phosphates yeah F- yeah uh, chemicals th- yeah and many other factories in, in many different uh, fields uh-huh. uh, Tadiran was part of this concern air conditioning yeah. cool from like derived from cool no it's just the name just, just the, the name. name like cool retour like cool uh, is that what it came from the name, yeah. ah okay yeah No, uh, okay so th- that was like a mega yeah, yeah, a mega under it you had like the air conditioning an air conditioning company and a ma- chemical company many many different companies were under I it. never heard about it actually they really. privatized it in the in the 90s uh-huh. and then they sold all the different companies <laughs> to different uh, so it was all run by the East yeah. and who controlled and the East you, you have Solel Bonnet and you have all the yeah, others yeah Solel Bonnet was big also in the 50s that yeah. was the company that built all the roads and, and it mm-hmm. was run by the state but who ruled the East I mean the listed route and the state you couldn't tell them apart in in the first tiers of Israel it was just like the same organization the same people that uh, were in the in Mapai the there was the same people as the Mapai was the party of uh, Prime Minister Ben Gurion yeah and which later became the labor party yeah and uh, those are the people that uh, established this to the route in, in the beginning in the 1920s and And uh, you have like uh, the, the same people run this the road and the government so, yeah that's mind <laughs> mind-boggling it's hard to hard to so how do how do we end up finding ourselves in Israel of 2022 which is fairly capitalist right I mean it seems like we started out in a I the trend has to be acknowledged right I mean we aren't going to towards more socialism no we're going towards less socialism right we started yeah. out as a as a country that seemed very. almost very like very little free market right there was very little free market mm-hmm. um and we are here in 2022 maybe we have a lot more to go but how did how did that shift happen and why okay so in the and beginning when? Uh, so the shift were mainly in, in 1985 this was the main shift but uh, we need to start earlier to understand it so in the beginning there there was a, a large wave of immigration to Israel in 1948 maybe the largest relative to the size of the population of the receiving population in the history of the 20th century 500,000 had to be basically absorb one million yeah something like that yeah so it was very massive wave from immigration and it created a lot of problems and uh, you have the austerity regime in this uh, in this area uh, and uh, you really needed uh, the state to intervene in the economy in order to supply all the goods and in order to make sure that the new immigrants will have a uh, welfare and they can learn Hebrew and uh, so it was so essential yeah it was essential in in many sense but uh, in Israel they all they always overdid it be uh, more than what was uh, essential uh, and this created many problems now the country was pretty always managed to somehow solve these problems mostly using uh, foreign aid from the United States and from uh, Germany uh, what and was from called, Jews yeah from Jews but also from Germany in the form of the uh, Dmeshi Lumim yeah the reparations agreement yeah so this was very helpful and this helped the country to uh, get a foreign currency which was always a problem here uh, and this system was pretty kind of walking but not very good there were always problems with the uh, lacking of uh, foreign currency uh, and inflation energy uh, fuel yeah food yeah uh, so but, but they, they were able to maintain some uh, standard of living that was not very low uh, in 1966 there was the first crisis when the 
uh, the reparation agreement just ceased. I mean, the money ceased to fl- uh, flow from Germany, uh, and they 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 had uh, uh, a crisis. They panicked. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Wait, Who's going to pay the bills? Before we get to the crisis, though, let's stop at the uh, at the at the austerity uh, government and the system that that led from forty eight to sixty six. So, how did that look like? So, the government controlled all industries and and doled out food and energy and everything to yeah. M- most of the industries were controlled by the government, by the istadrut, and maybe by the kibbutzim also. Many industries was in, uh, were in the kibbutzim. But the kibbutzim were so ruled by, also by... Yeah. So we, what, what did it look like, me as an Israeli citizen living back then, what did it look like? I woke up in the morning, I went to go work for the government, basically. I was given yeah, a many, paycheck by the government. Many people were working for the government. Almost all the people were members of the Istadrut through their, uh, what we call, Kupat Cholim, through their the, uh, health organizations. Uh, and... Um, you couldn't get a uh, walk uh, in like uh, in many areas without being a member in those organizations and people that opposed the, the government had problems getting a uh, walk in um, government uh, factory or organizations is this yeah. the story with the pitkita duma Pinkas. like yeah. Yeah. pinkasa dome Pinkasa that people dome. needed yeah, a little red, red membership for the mapai the the ruling party yeah and if they didn't have that it was difficult no, it's not the party it's the histadrut no officially uh, the, yeah the, the red booklet was membership in the histadrut in the histadrut yeah but again you couldn't yeah uh, it was make the difference yeah. between them it's and a proxy the party. it's a proxy of the party what did the government the makeup of the government look like was it 90 percent mapai or was it no there were many different uh, parties And they had a coalition and they had opposition but the Mapai coalition was, the was Mapai, yeah the coal I mean was it 120 back then yes 120 seats yeah and the coalition was not today like 61 it was no far no. bigger yeah it was far but bigger. Pa- Mapai I think was 50 something mandates and uh, so you didn't need as much as I, I think as back as, as basically today. if you wanted it was people begging to be part of the coalition as opposed to the people running right. after trying to make a coalition and of course yeah. the big uh right-wing government begins uh, uh, party sorry begins party uh was never part of the coalition they were boycotted mm-hmm. which remind which yeah which uh, makes you wonder right history repeats itself and if you were a right-wing begin supporter uh you you weren't part of the histadrut you wouldn't get the red booklet you couldn't get the jobs and uh, so that created some problems yeah there are a lot of tensions uh, around it uh, and in the crisis of uh, 1966 people also demonstrated against the istadrut because they feel like the istadrut is part of the government it, it is the same establishment from their point of view what did it look like for those non-red booklet holding individuals like That was there a black market of jobs? No, I mean, they had jobs, but they couldn't get very far and they couldn't get jobs in many of the more, in many of the better places, in many of the uh, organizations that were run by the Istadrut and the government. This is like unwritten rules, meaning they, could, they were employed as low-level workers, but they would never get promoted. Yeah, it was hard to get promoted. I it see. was always like soft. It was never very strict. It's not like a, a caste uh, system like you have yeah. in India. But uh, it, it is hard. known. Yeah, it is known. It was like <laughs> a discrimination. Discrimination, not official discrimination. I mean, uh, w- w- one of the maybe more extreme stories where um, there were uh, people in, in Haifa port that uh, demonstrated against the Istadrut and against the uh, Tzim company. Tzim is also today, today a yeah. large company of... One uh, of the biggest companies today still. Yeah, of shipping, uh, shipping and uh, ships. So it was also owned by the Istadrut. And the Istadrut, it is very unique for a, a labor organization because it was both the labor organization of those workers and also the employer. And this <laughs> was a big problem. <laughs> and they demonstrated against the Instadrut. And uh, what happened is that uh, Ben Gurion uh, had them recruited to the army in order to break the demonstrations. 
Wow. He drafted them. In yeah, he drafted 66. them. In 66. Uh, no, it's not, it was uh, before 66. It was uh, in the 50s. Ah, fi- in the 50s. Yeah, it was already in the 50s. So he just drafted them. <laughs> yeah, he drafted them. <laughs> and it got to the newspapers. It was a very big okay. deal. I mean, people didn't <laughs> like it. Yeah, uh, but he but just, he literally signed a piece of paper to draft those specific yeah, yeah. people. What like a hundred, couple hundred people in, in, to Boom. the yeah to the, to the army to the reserve. Because duty. it's worth wow. mentioning that although the state controlled almost everything and it did control the radio, you didn't have TV back then, and it did have newspapers. There was free press. Yeah, there was free press, and there was very very free press. Like you had the Haulama Zeh was a very big opposition to Ben Gurion so such stories would get like you couldn't hide such you can, a story you can yeah. oppress Jews and stop them from doing a lot of things except for talking <laughs> you can't yeah. shut a Jew up <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. Yeah, so, so there was there was opposition, but uh, it was relatively weak in those okay. years. Okay. So ha- what happens that leads you leads it's us to eighty five? Well, what happens in sixty six first? So in sixty six, there's a big demonstration across all of Israel. No, so in in sixty six, they just ran out of foreign currency, and ah. they had a lot of economic problems, and uh, the the government had to initiate, um, like a, a, a plan. Milagotun. Ah, Mitun. Uh, recession. A recession, yeah. Ah. They had to initiate a recession uh, in order to uh, uh, decrease the salaries and uh, to uh, decrease the government expansions and, and so on. Okay. They so basically had no more money and they yeah, needed to uh, start yeah, cutting. Cut everything. Yeah, yeah, they needed to cut everything and then there were a lot of demonstrations and uh, many people lose their, uh, lost their jobs and so on. 66, uh, Levi Eshkol is in power. Uh, yeah, it was under Lavi Eshkol and Pinchas Sapir was the uh, right. But it was the ma- but but it was a mess that Ben Gurion left basically. Because yeah, Ben Gurion, uh, I think, resigned in '65 or something like that. Yeah, right. yeah, it, it's complicated. Yeah, but uh, they were they were all involved in yeah, this, yeah, yeah. Uh, in they were all this mess. Uh, accomplices. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. And then they they were lucky because uh, the war. Th- yeah, the war of '65, the war of '67. Uh, six 60 yeah 67 the war of six days uh, came along and they just uh, had to stop this recession and uh, after the war everybody was very optimist and <laughs> so they uh, yeah so they they tried to think that the, all the problems just uh, go away but this wasn't the case and after that uh, inflation started to increase uh, also in the 70s and they had uh, many other plans after the 73 war the government, uh, the military expenses were just like skyrocketed. And uh, in the 70s, Israel was probably the country with the largest share of government in the, in the GDP relative to non-communist countries. Uh, so it was number one in the world. And also you had a ga- uh, like energy problem in the 70s. People don't know this, but in the 70s, there was we because of the APAC, uh, right? The Arab countries yeah. rebelled. Yeah, but this OPEC. is this had le- OPEC. Le- yeah, yeah. This actually had a relatively small effect on Israel because we imported most of the oil from Iran and Mexico, which yeah. were not part of this. But still, uh, there was a period you had to you had to choose a day in which you're not allowed to drive your car. Yeah, basically, and each car had a sticker. Mm. With uh, like you know, if, uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and th- on that day you couldn't drive the car to save gas. You drove around <laughs> on a Sunday, and you had the Sunday sticker. Yeah. People gave you the <laughs> dirty yeah, look. Exactly. Yeah. So there were a lot of problems, and inflation I- increased increased during this period, and uh, the government tried to like uh, postpone uh, the the need to. Uh, make necessary steps. I mean, the, the main problem with inflation is always uh, the government budget. You need to really cut the budget in order to deal with inflation, but uh, governments were not willing to do it. Uh, not like California now that wants to dole out uh, inflation checks to yeah. relieve, <laughs> relieve inflation by spending more money. Don't yeah. worry that your money's not worth anything. We have a solution. We'll just print you some more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Th- this doesn't really work. <laughs> okay, uh, shucks. <laughs> yeah. So, um, 
in uh, in uh, 77 you have uh, like the mahapach yeah the when uh, begin was uh, elected to be prime minister but uh, also the likud uh, the, the likud party which was now uh, in government they also couldn't really cut the budget uh, in the right way i mean you, you need to have the cooperation of the istadrut and they were like rivals politically so it was complicated and uh, Begin also had a lot of commitment to many unprivileged groups in the Israeli society. So he had to increase the welfare uh, state and uh, increase the welfare payments and so on. So this didn't help. And some of the finance ministers tried to do steps in the right direction, but they just didn't have enough power to make the necessary steps. Who was Begin's finance minister? Uh, they, he had four. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, he just there, replaced them. The problem. <laughs> yeah, he replaced them one after another, and they they all weren't uh, able to do the necessary steps. What is the necessary steps to cut the budget? I mean, they really need to to make large cuts in the government budget, so it will uh, stop uh, taking loans after uh, central bank and stop printing money. Essentially, let's talk about. Um, the budget and the GDP and how it's supposed to, what, what's the relationship? Like for a healthy developing slash developed country, what's the difference between developing developed? Like what percentage of the GDP should the government be involved in? Uh, I mean, the percent of the GDP is, is less important. What's important in this case is the independence of the central bank. I mean, when you look at countries like Argentina or countries in Africa, in most cases the central bank is the central bank is not independent, and the state is actually printing money in order to finance its expenses, and then you get uh, hyperinflation. Because the politician can tell the bank do one, two, three, mm-hmm. and they have to do it basically. Yeah, I mean, it can tell the bank, I'm taking a loan from you. And I don't really deal uh, with it. Yeah, deal with it. I'm not. Uh, I don't intend to repay this loan. That so how do you make the central bank independent by requiring legislation? Yeah, yeah. So this was part of the problem, and uh, I mean, when we get to like uh, 1984, uh, we have. Um, I'm not sure how to say it in English. Memshel Unity government. Yeah, unity the government. The first unity government in the history of Israel. Yeah. Between so the Likud and Avoda. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this unity government still didn't want to do the necessary steps. So they went to the Americans and they asked for more money and other loans. And the Americans didn't give them more money. They sent here uh, Stanley Fisher and, and some other economists that I don't remember the names. And they told the, the Israelis that they first need to uh, uh, pass legislation that will make the central bank really independent. So this was the first uh, positive step that they made to stop this uh, problem of uh, high inflation. I mean, this was a, uh, a time when the inflation was like 400% a year, now, which is very high. Here we got to make a, a pause because I don't think here in Israel people don't realize what happened back then. And of course, people in the world don't know what it means 400. I, I can tell two anecdotes that I know about. One anecdote from that period is that my grandparents uh, immediately could pay their mortgage. Like, so they had a mortgage, they were Olim, and they could pay like in a month the mortgage, right? Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> the entire sum, because it was the, the number in the bank of the mortgage was worthless. Yeah. Right, because how does it happen? Can you explain? Because the the mu- the amount is from you know a year or two year or ten years ago, yeah. And all of a sudden, money that is worth less, and they just have tons and tons of money, right? Yeah, and, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't adjusted to the inflation. Yeah, exactly. I mean, m- many people that uh, the government in those years lent many uh, lent money to the kibbutzim and to other factories, and this. Uh, uh, this land programs was actually a gift because the money <laughs> was just worthless uh, some years Today, later. Today, m- m- like part of the mortgage loans that you take are, are uh, adjusted for inflation. Yeah, Meaning yeah. as if all of a sudden there's hyperinflation, your mortgage, the amount of money you owe to the bank grows. Yeah. And another story together. I heard from someone who lived back there in, in Tel Aviv, she told me that she vividly remembers like she's going out to try and, and take some cash. 
and she went from one cash machine to another and they were packed. So she drove all around town and she couldn't find there. Like people were in complete hysteria. Like in one day, everyone were storming yeah. the, the well, cash machines. Get, yeah, once you get the paycheck from your job, you, you just have to take the money out and spend it immediately. <laughs> uh, I mean, there was one uh, article in this uh, that I, wrote, I read in the paper that said that every Israeli is now a finance minister of, of its own. I mean, everyone <laughs> needs to always calculate what it does and... And uh, one of the big problems is that uh, when you have a factory, you don't know what is your status. You don't know if you are making money, if you are losing money. You don't know if an investment pays off or not. You, you don't know anything. It's like you don't know what to do. But yeah. it happened because the government just printed money. To cover its expenses. Because there was also another war. Right, that cost money. And yeah, the war uh, Lebanon against Lebanon. War. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it, it was part of the problem. It just increased the, the problem. Mm -hmm. But uh, the roots were... But why didn't fall. they, because the inflation got to 400, why didn't they do anything at when it was 10 or 20? Because the, the necessary steps were very not popular. You need to uh, stop uh, subsidies. You need to cut uh, wages. You need to deal, do things that are... Uh, mm -hmm. Not very popular. I mean, one of the problems were that everybody expected the inflation to go on. And uh, in this period of time, most of the wages in the Israeli economy uh, were made by uh, um, a central... Like a, a central committee. Yeah, a committee by, by between the Istadrut and the... <laughs> Uh, owners of the factories. It was not like a free market where you uh -huh. have like wages that are uh, free to increase or decrease. Yeah. And all of these uh, wage agreements had to be cut in order to deal with the inflation because if everybody expects that the wages, that the prices will increase, so everybody demands wage that will increase also and then the costs of the factories increase and they, they have to increase the prices of the product and so it's like a self-driving yeah, slippery slope uh, yeah was israel always printing money or i mean at some some level because in the united states didn't they decouple the dollar from gold somewhere in the 70s uh, no it's not related to this problem it's not really printing money it's more like taking loans from the central bank and then the central bank had to print money to cover these loans but so but israel the central bank in israel was printing money I mean, yeah but we were weren't we using currency that wasn't israeli or was it it wasn't lirot it was shekels all the way yeah, from the it beginning was, yeah it was, lirot. It, it was lirot israeli lirot it, it was, was israeli lirot yeah it okay was israeli so they were currency. printing they were printing money here in israel yeah. from 48 uh, yeah, to some degree. I mean, one okay. of the problems was that they didn't have enough foreign currency. So they always had to devalue the shekel. And this is like, this is causing... Uh, they were also controlling the rates. Yeah. Which is ridiculous. Uh, yeah. And this they were controlling the trade rates between shekel and dollar. Ah. So, I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what I'm asking, is that the Israeli lira back since the, the establishment of the state was never tied to any any actual uh, thing of intrinsic value it was just paper money it was it was fiat money from the beginning in in all the world it was it's fiat money it's no, not but there was there was at some point where money was tied to the gold standard right yeah yeah but uh, in america we're talking about uh, a later uh, era okay. okay i mean this was after the gold standard was okay. uh, announced uh, and um, so how did they solve the problem so they solved the problem by cutting the budget, which was, uh, I mean, first they had like the, the legislation that we talked about with the Bank of Israel that really uh, made it uh, independent of the government. And after that, there was a meeting by uh, Perez, which was the prime, min prime minister at the time and all the other ministers. And uh, they had a very long meeting. And in the end, they had to cut a lot of uh, uh, a lot of subsidies, you know, they had to cut the budget, uh, they had to cut uh, the military budget also. But uh, they also changed the whole rules of the game. Yeah. In one night. This came later. It wasn't really at one night. Uh, at the beginning, they also had to freeze prices and wages throughout the economy for a few months. Uh, and then uh, and the plan worked after immediately after this meeting you see the inflation goes down by a lot and the growth came up and uh, 
there were also uh, not a lot of unemployment, so it was a very, very good plan. And this plan was the point where the, like the, the general conception of how you can run an economy just changed. Okay, but it wasn't overnight. It took several years, and people saw that it's working. And then you get all the other things like uh, opening for foreign trade and uh, like freeing the markets from the government uh, between like 85 and the beginning of the 90s. You have many other uh, reforms. So it sounds like Begin didn't necessarily wasn't the uh, redeemer of Israel from the economic standpoint. I mean, he no. kind of he brought he led the right into government from a political standpoint, but not necessarily economics. W it, but it was the right. I mean, it was Itzhak Shamir who ended up making these these changes. It was Peres and Itzhak Shamir, okay, and also their uh, finance ministries. I see. So the left actually had hand in in freeing mm -hmm. in freeing they Israel had no choice. economically. I mean, yeah, the left was the only one that could control the Istadrut and change the Istadrut uh, and, and uh, like separate the government from the Istadrut. Like, what would have happened if they didn't do that? If they would, we would live uh, in. We would be like Argentina, I guess, or Greece. I mean, we'd, we would need to have help from uh, other countries. And uh, we could probably lose our uh, political economy to make decisions. I mean, when, once you are economically um, dependent on other countries, you are not free as you, you want to be. Mm -hmm. And where does the Istadut stand today? Like, when did the main... I mean, it sounds like they were very, very powerful. When did they start losing power? At this point, they start In losing the power. Yeah, I mean, most of the critics of this uh, uh, this plan, they believe that the Istadrut would be able to somehow turn uh, Shimon Peres around and just uh, eliminate the most important parts of this uh, new plan. But uh, it wasn't able to. I mean, at the end, they also... There was no way back. Yeah, there was no bank, and and maybe uh, many people that were from the inside of the Istadrut also changed their minds. I mean, they just saw that the system that they made didn't work anymore, and they saw the the, the standards. They were of like, "We trust the free markets." <laughs> yeah, I mean, they saw the standards <laughs> of living in other countries. They saw the the changes that were made at the same time by Thatcher and Reagan and other people around the, the world. Uh, and uh, people just change their mind. Did it get ugly and violent at any point? Because it's like new unions around the world are notorious for sometimes getting a bit uh, uh, shady. Yeah, so there are many demonstrations, but uh, one of the uh, results of what we talked before about this uh, trust and democracy was that in Israel uh, there were not uh, a lot of violence involved in this uh, situation. And I think this is also something unique. I mean, this is something that we used to see in uh, developing countries, but not in developed countries. In many developed countries, similar plans uh, were led uh, led to like military coup and so on. Mm -hmm. So, what can we learn today? Like what we like uh, from the history? What's relevant for nowadays um, in Israel, in Israeli economy, Israeli politics? I mean, many things are relevant. I mean, w one of the most uh, th uh, frustrating things that uh, is that we are somewhat limited by our, by, uh, our past, and the things that we decide today might affect uh, the decades uh, in the future. So uh, it's hard to get away from these limitations, but uh, we need to continue with the steps Wha that we're. Uh, Why is it that? It seems like the economy is so thriving. Everybody, like many people, like objectively, people are richer than twenty years ago, right? We can yeah. agree. But this is uh, this is true for any country in the world, almost any country. In and the inequality world. is in decline in Israel. Yeah, constantly. Okay. Yeah, in the last ten years or fifteen right. years. So how how can you? P I mean, uh, to what you were just saying, that that's true for every country in the world. How can we say that you know the the changes that were made to our economic system in the 80s are are actually what uh resulted in our in our prosperity today maybe it's just the technological revolution i mean the internet was starting to be made in the early 90s right late 80s and and 
eventually we had all the high tech. So what's to say it wasn't, you know? Yeah, but all of the good stuff, you see that they came up only after 85. I mean, the high tech industry, we didn't have a high tech industry or electronics industry. The first uh, McDonald's. Yeah, the first McDonald's and so on. <laughs> the opening of the markets to foreign imports and all, all of these things happened only after 85. First shopping mm. mall. So you, can, you, you do see Specifically this in like Israel? A, yeah. Or in around Israel. the world? No, no, Israel. So maybe it was just a trickle-down effect. I mean, the whole world was slowly getting richer and more advanced and progressing and Israel caught up. No, but it, it, you see this, the, the, the rules that are changing and the legislation that are changing, and you see these uh, reforms after 85. Without these reforms, we, do, we wouldn't have McDonald's and we wouldn't have uh, free imports and other things. So Can you, you compare Israel to maybe a different country at, the, at similar times and see that there was a disparity in our rates of growth? Like, you know what I mean? Like, can you say that from 48 all the way up to 85, the United States was growing at an unprecedented rate in Israel? Meaning there are, you can isolate some variables. You could say there were countries that were progressing at, at rates much higher than, than Israel's. Uh, there were some countries, but I don't know if a good experiment, like you say, when, when you can really compare two countries, because each country has its own story. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty hard to do something. Like it's that. hard to make like uh, like um, empirical statements in economics, right? Yeah, it's really yeah. difficult. Yeah, you don't have a large sample of, of states. Yeah. yeah, and you also, I mean, there's so many variable factors that it's hard to isolate things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what? So again, what exactly stops us today from being truly rich and successful? So uh, we still have a very like socialist uh, en environment, or like conception when you think about uh, government officials, when you think about uh, uh, the politicians themselves. They have like a very um, perception of. Um, uh, like uh, central planning of the economy and things that uh, you don't What's see. That's like the, the biggest example for a relic from the past that still exists today and, and affects our life. You see the Easter route that still has a lot How of How do they affect today. my life today? Uh, it still controls many of the, uh, mostly uh, the labor unions in the government sector, the teachers controls yeah, like teachers like the ports so the strike ports. of the teachers we just had it has to do with the histadult uh, yeah and, and the other organizations i mean the teachers are not a part of the histadult they, the, they have their own unions yeah but uh, the the unions is very uh, far powerful in israel economy and also the unions that control other uh, main uh, infrastructures and how can that be changed i mean isn't it just their right to unionize? And are they forcing teachers to join the union? Do you have to be a part of the union if you want to be a teacher? Yes, in Israel, really? you have to be. Yeah. And also, the many of the rules that uh, govern the ability of people to unionize in Israel are far more extreme than in the United States, in England, and other countries. Like in England, I know I just talked to someone who told me, like, I don't understand. Like in the late 80s, Thatcher just, just. Uh, outlawed the the unions of the teachers. I don't know if it outlawed, but uh, it, it is uh, much harder than uh, than and, it is. And it, it and I what I did know is it still persists there. Like mm -hmm. the 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 things Thatcher did, they never they, nobody ever changed that. So it still affects. Like it's still in, in the problem. I think it, it needs to be stated. The problem with unionization in the public sector is that basically. The government is ganging up on the vote on the on the citizen, right? Because it's basically the government fighting against the citizen and and unionizing against the voter. But technically, I mean, if you wanted to unionize in private industry, it shouldn't necessarily be outlawed, right? No, People no, should be uh, in, free to unionize in private industry. The the competition uh, is uh, like uh, limiting the ability of unions to succeed. Yeah, to succeed or to uh, uh, make uh, organizations inefficient. But uh, in the government sector, you don't have this competition, so you don't have limits. 
So this is this is the real problem in Israel. And yeah. also, I, I see members of Knesset from the left, from the Labour Party, ironically, saying like we should um, increase the deficit. We should take more loans as a country. The state should take more loans, invest it in infrastructure, in I don't know, in the social workers and whatever. And it's okay because uh, the state can do that. So yeah, generally popular uh, populist ideas like that. Have so why is that popular. wrong uh, from an economic point of view? Why can't the state? Like we're rich. Uh, I mean, it's, it's wrong because we have to pay back the debt. I mean, it's not like... Yeah, but if we invest it in uh, things that will increase... Like, the, the, like if we invest it in a metro system, for example, right? It will increase the economy in the long term. Then we can... Ease, we can it might increase, it might not increase. I mean, it depends on how, how efficient your government is. Uh, in Israel, there is like a state of mind that uh, government can do wonders and uh, there is like a, an illusion of government uh, control that can, uh, for example, change the geographic distribution of the population. Mm. Uh, in other countries, most governments don't try to uh, turn people... Send them to the periphery. Yeah, send them to the peripheral areas and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in Israel they do, and they many even though all of these reforms uh, didn't uh, help, they, they still believe that one day they will be able to uh, make people uh, leave Tel Aviv. But why not? I mean, Noah brings up a good point. Like, why, if you know, if the government is why 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 shouldn't the government make investments like a private company, right? I mean, a private company can. Or a private individual, an entrepreneur or investor can invest money take and loan. take a risk, take a loan and take a risk, and then he's he's accountable for it. So I maybe mean, if we have a good, smart government that, that invests intelligently, then it could be a great success, no? Yeah, theoretically, great but uh, in reality, they don't have skin in the game. And because they don't have skin in the game, they tend to make investments in a very inefficient way. Mm. Uh, I mean, in Israel, for example, uh, when they wanted people to live in in, in, in places like Kriyat Gat, in the peripheral areas, they, uh, they just decided that they will build uh, textile f uh, uh, factories there. So they uh, brought uh, rich uh, Jews from other countries and they subsidized them and, uh, and those uh, Jews uh, opened uh, many uh, textile industries in, in peripheral areas in Israel. And it was a big failure because <laughs> Israel don't have uh, the, I mean, we have, uh, we don't have a relative uh, advantage in textile industry. Over Chinese little kids. Yeah. I mean, Child we have a uh, high cost of labors and so on. So th this is the kind of things that you get if you have government officials doing the investment. So the book is not an optimistic book. Uh, not really. I mean, I try to be <laughs> optimistic about the future, uh, but uh, what you really need is like to change the uh, the common perceptions in the population, in the media, in the government, and you need people to, to really understand that uh, economic growth is something that comes from the bottom up and not the other way around in order to really change things. So a state can't plan its own growth basically no not really it never worked yeah it most uh, except it, for china yeah except for uh, south korea and some other very very unique examples yeah. it it usually don't work how did south korea tell us the story maybe in short can you tell us like the 60 second version of how south south korea is a socialist dream yeah i mean it's not a socialist dream but uh, south korea in the 60s and 50s it was not even a democratic country but uh, when you're trying to plan the, the economy ahead, you need to make the right bet because you don't really know the market. You don't get the signals from the market of what, what you want to invest. So in Israel, they betted on the in, uh, uh, agriculture and textile, which was a failure. In South Korea, they betted on the electronics uh, industries. And this was a huge success. I mean, mm. all these companies, LG and Samsung and so on, they were highly subsidized uh, in the beginnings. So you need to uh, guess the future. 
So you're saying if, yeah, if you take a bunch of countries that invested in a bunch of different industries, there's bound to be one that yeah. ends up succeeding. Yeah, but so if, you, if you let the markets decide, you don't have to guess the future. You don't have to be a, f- a profit. So how, let's talk about that, because you, you made that claim at the beginning that it was essential that Israel be founded on a, you know, a government-led economy at the be- in, the, in the early years. It Is there no other way to... To get signals from the market? Is there no other way to free up the market at the beginning stages? There was a way. Uh, they had, uh, they needed the government intervention in order to deal with the immigration. Uh, so, so this was the main uh, issue. But uh, they could free the market earlier. I mean, it wasn't... Uh, meaning to deal with immigration, meaning to absorb the immigrants, yeah. to, to house them, yeah. to feed them, mm-hmm. things like that. Yeah. But and because you ha- you didn't have time, <laughs> markets need time. You, you can't create a market from nothing in in six months. Yeah, you didn't have time, and all the resources also go through the government because most of the resources come from abroad. But what would have happened if I mean, paint us you know the worst picture if Israel just let a million people come in and organize themselves, and you know inhabit lands, occupy. You, uh, but they came with nothing. Yeah, you had a high level of inequality. And uh, I mean, I think that the, the largest fear of the governments back then was that people would just take their things and immigrate to the, to the, uh, the United States. Mm. This was the fear. You had competition. You had free markets between the countries yeah, themselves. Yeah, you had uh, competition in, in, <laughs> in the immigration. Uh, I see, field. I see. And you give amazing numbers in the book. Like you talked about it a little bit, but you show that actually in the 30s, I think, or in the 20s, um, like we say, wow, what big immigration waves of Jews to Israel, to Palestine. But in fact, like the numbers of Jewish immigrants to America and to Australia, I think. In Canada. In Canada, it's like quadruple or times 10 like the huge amounts of jews moved to other places yeah only after 1924 uh, you really see the big waves only after the united states blocked the immigration Uh uh-huh which is fascinating so okay that's amazing i mean if i if you make me the dictator i'll just uh, invest in metaverse and bitcoin and then (laughs) we'll be the next south korea so, we might, so it's a good we, thing. we might not. Yeah, yeah, I'm not <laughs> voting for you as dictator. Um, what is there? If you're a you know a capitalist and living in Israel today, is there is there a? And I'm not asking you to endorse a political party here, but just on the basis of like you know free market ideology, and I want the market to be a freer space. I want to you know uh, reduce government spending. Uh, break up government unions as much as possible and increase the freedom of businesses and individuals to operate in the market. Is there a political party that that really um, represents that? No, not really. I mean, <laughs> in Israel, both well, that's left. That's a shame. And, yeah. <laughs> but if, I, if you had to put them on a scale from zero, from least to most, who would, who would win the title of... You're shitty, but not that. Sh- you're the least shitty. Uh, Who would win the least it's, shitty? It's easier to title. to identify the most shitty. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Who's the most shitty? You can see in, in both the the far left and the far right, you see parties like uh, in the left you see uh, Meretz and the, the the Arabic parties and so on, which are some of them are almost communist parties. And in the right, you have uh, parties like uh, Shas, which was not exactly a right-wing party, but uh, it represents the ultra-Orthodox... Uh, Mizrahi Jews. Yeah, Mizrahi Jews, uh, which also is very far from uh, free market uh, ideas, and they tend to uh, increase the welfare state and to... Yeah, so do the Torah yeah, as well. Also. So, okay, so those are the most shitty. You can't, you can't yeah. give a crown to the least shitty? It's, it's not a you're great. Be. It's just uh, it's a BB in two thousand and three. Yeah, yeah. BB was very good in two thousand and three, but uh, in the recent years, it wasn't. He wasn't. Uh, he had Kahlon in the in the government. He had uh, many excuses, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you don't really. But see BB in two thousand and three, like, is it safe to say that after eighty five, two thousand and three was the the most important year? 
Yeah, yeah. In 2003, we had an, another uh, economic crisis in Israel. And you Bibi had and Sharon are there. Yeah, and Sharon was the prime minister yeah. and Bibi was the uh, finance minister. Mm-hmm. And they did a lot of very, very good reforms. And then in 2006, the Likud uh, really failed the elections. So I think that mainly maybe Bibi just learned that uh, doing the right thing is not very politically... Uh, worthwhile yeah lucrative yeah so it from 2009 to 2019 2021 when did he 2020 2020 yeah no i don't remember no 2021 when he stepped down 2021 2021 so from 2009 to 2021 there were there was nothing of uh of import that bb did that that really influenced the economy for the better there were some uh, things. I mean, I think that the most uh, uh, successful one was about the natural gas mm-hmm. reforms that were very, very good and very successful, led by uh, Steinitz. So uh, this was a good, uh, good s- a step in the right direction. Not allowing the government to take over. Yeah, and I mean, and the the agreement the agreement that they did with the gas companies was uh, relatively good. Also, they continued the, the long-term trend of opening markets, generally not as fast as I would like. But uh, For example, like what markets did they, the, the cell phone market and... A bit, yeah. A bit. I mean, it's, uh, um, it's a bit complicated, but uh, there were uh, some of the goods market that were opened, to a free import or at least freer than before. But maybe the most important thing in those years is what they didn't do. They didn't um, disturb the high tech economy from doing its thing, right? It would have been so easy for a socialist government to put sticks in the in their in the feet of the high tech world. To tax them at, at right? 80%. Yeah. I think that's 89%, the biggest thing. Like Bennett. He did. He he didn't do anything. He didn't do anything to bother the high tech from becoming like the biggest no? Uh yeah. I don't know that other uh, parties were going to do differently, but uh, You see now, you see the hatred from the left towards the high tech industry, right? You yeah, see you how see they some. despise them and they want to tax the hell out of them and like they're the biggest enemy. So, I mean, yeah, you could also you could always do wars. Yeah, <laughs> that's what we're looking for. At least, no, but isn't, it, isn't isn't the high tech industry the, is isn't it the most important thing about Israel's economy in the last decade? I think that the high tech industry in Israel is very unique in the sense that you don't have other very good industries. <laughs> I mean, when you look at the United States, people can have a very high wages also as, as movie lawyers. in the movie industry. No, I, I'm talking about... States. Ah, you're talking about... Like big uh, industries. Yeah, industries that have high wages. So if you look at the United States or Europe, you have people with very high wages in uh, in the medical industry, mm-hmm. in the law, in finance, in many industries. Mm-hmm. And in Israel, only in the high-tech industry. In real so, estate, in construction, yeah. even... And army. Yeah, so... Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and this is a problem. I mean, the problem in Israel is not that the high-tech industry is so successful, is why all the other industries are not uh, so successful. And this is always goes back to the problem of competition, of uh, d- different uh, barriers to competition in many industries, uh, uh, monopolies, and so on. But I think it also has to do, I mean, with the high-tech industry provides services mainly to abroad meaning it's an export really mm-hmm. yeah. right we don't but but you don't have many industries other industries in israel that could provide you know what i mean the the other strong industries that you have in the united states they're they're not an export they're providing services to goods and services to americans yeah but you have uh, countries like switzerland that they have a very very good financial industry Mm-hmm. And they have many... But again, it's an export, right? Yeah, it's an export. I mean, small countries are built on exporting their services to larger countries like Germany and France and the United States. But do you have a, a small country that has several successful exporting industries? Yeah, many. Yeah. Like uh, Netherlands and Switzerland and Sweden. All of them had different problems than Israel. And all of them have many successful industries, not just one. Not like just we one. Have in 
And uh, it's a at least we got the one, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. Yeah. yeah. And so I guess the least shitty. Okay, we won't we won't crown a least shitty. But is there something in the last ten, twelve years that BB? I mean, other than not doing uh, bad things and doing small things that are good, did he do something that hurt the economy? That that took it backwards? Was there any action that was? Severe. I, I think that uh, one of the problems that uh, was that uh, he tended to um, make his political rivals um, ministries of finance. <laughs> I mean, th- this was the case both in with Cahlon and with Lapid. Yair Lapid. Yeah, yeah and yeah. both of them were not very good uh, ministries of yeah. finance because they they just tried to be popular. And uh, when you think about it, Steinitz was the best minister of finance because he didn't try to be popular. He just he worked with Bibi, and they're uh, from the same party, guys. Yeah, if you, yeah, yeah, he was from the same party, and because of that, he was able to do at least some of the uh, things in the right direction. Mm-hmm. It's weird though, because isn't the the finance is that maybe that's why he did it? The finance ministry is where politicians go to die, right? So he was trying some to send them. them to yeah. 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 Although with Kach, I don't think it's that, like with Lapid. Yeah, I, 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 he liked the concept of putting him there. But I think with Kachlon, he didn't have a choice. Like I think Kachlon realized, like this is the place for him to shine. So he ex, uh, ex, r- 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 I lost the word. He uh, like took it by by force from BB, right? Ah, Extorted it from BB. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, but I think that we knew that Kachlon will probably fail in his uh, yeah efforts. Wow. Okay, so not not much optimism today. No. <laughs> um, but so, okay, I, I was going to ask the same question. I guess yeah. I, I'm dying yeah. to know who to yeah. vote for because that really is for a lot of for us at least, and I think for a lot of our listeners, kind of top of the ticket. Like, you know, there is of course Israel is is one of the most important things is national security, but I think. The next thing in many voters' mind is is the economy, and especially now, and it's hard. It's, yeah, especially uh, now, really when, big issue here. Yeah, around the world. Yeah, when economies are are crashing crumbling. and crumbling, then it's it's something that is at top of mind. But you don't have much of a, an optimistic. Uh, uh, no, I don't. I I personally don't know who I will vote for. Yeah. The last okay. government, they did some uh, in one year. They did some uh, good things in the economy, right? Yeah, I mean, Bennett had some of the right ideas. He had like this uh, Singapore plan. Yeah. yeah, didn't do anything from that plan. No, not much. That's but uh, <laughs> Lieberman was uh, not very bad. I mean, as a finance minister, he, he was tried. able to... They tried to do the yeah, something. I mean, they what were some f- of the highlights from the Lieberman? Uh, I mean, uh, when you look at the agricultural sector, they really tried to free the markets and they stood up against the pressure groups in this area. Uh, at least to some degree so this has an effect on the cost they of did a big reform on uh, for small businesses like yeah, to open also. like they cut regulations yeah. for business which yeah. is also important but to lower the tax that's what nobody has the guts to do like yeah. to cut the budget and lower the taxes and the taxes are so high and also to cut the um, military budgets yeah it's also a problem yeah mm. Wow, okay. So the book is available in Hebrew, Blue and White Money, Kesef Kaholavan. If you speak Hebrew, if you can read Hebrew, it's highly recommended. Where can people can people order it online? Yeah, they can order a dig- uh, digital copy. Ah, there's a digital copy. Today, yeah. guys, we, we mentioned this in the last episode with Google. You can basically translate the entire book. So if you're really interested, yeah. buy it. You can use, I mean, today I, I bought the Google Pixel, and mm-hmm. you can just take a photo live translate like you can hold yeah. it above a book and live it's, tra- cool. it's amazing yeah. so you can read a book in any language guys blue and white money check it out by dr ori Katz. also he has uh there isn't a google app for that yet but he has a hebrew language podcast <laughs> called uh, creative destruction yeah. Heres Yetzirati. yeah uh, and so you tweet it you're on twitter but mostly in hebrew yeah ori Katz on twitter uh, anything else we need to plug before we go? Okay, yeah. we're good. So, uh, guys, please, if you listen to this on Spotify, please give us five stars on Spotify. Yes. Also, we're on Patreon now. So, if you like the show, uh, go to patreon.com slash twinjp and support us. And that is it. 
Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you, will the, thank will you. you translate the book sometime? Is there hope? Maybe sometime in the future. Okay, guys, if you want him to translate the book, <laughs> please hit him up on his email or his, on Twitter uh, so that Ori knows that you guys want to read it in English. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks Bye, for guys. tuning in. Bye. <laughs>